that he wore the crown of thorns on his forehead somehow is a statement of the thoughts of men that have been exceedingly wicked throughout the whole history of the human race and his hands pierced because of what we have given our hands to do and our feet where our feet have brought us into traffic so these these are symbolic uh, penetrations in his very body occasioned by the way in which we have thought, spoken, acted, walked and done but it needs to register. I'm not happy with my own understanding. And the pity is that it can reduce itself to just a safe doctrinal consent, but without the, the penetration that leads to true piety, love of righteousness, the hatred of iniquity, true praise, worship, and service as servants, and in the end, adoration. Adoration the ultimate statement of the deepest respect uh, uh, and reverence emotionally to which a human being can be brought is yet before us and outside of our experience. If we ever get there, and we ought, it will be through this route or not at all. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, as scandalous as it is, and it's a scandal, religiously speaking. I'm not ashamed of it. Why? Because it itself is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he's not ashamed because the, the message, the account of it, is itself a power, as you expressed it, the impact of, that, of the missionary to his hearers. It opened their understanding. It opened the awareness of themselves as guilty before God in transgression. The message itself does that. So he's not ashamed of it because it has that inherent power, foolish as it is, scandalous as it is, the proclamation in the anointing and authority of God has this effect of revealing the truth of one's condition and of the provision made for it. No other thing can. That's why we Jewish people are without any ability to see the truth of our condition or to have a true atonement because the gospel has not been proclaimed to us, though Paul says, to the Jew first. So have we known that power? Have we seen in our own proclamation people affected by it? Or do we give an explanation in human terms that lessens the impact, if not robs it, because the message itself is too crude, too bloody, too scandalous. So maybe we're packaging something that is more humanly acceptable but depletes the power of the gospel itself and that what is he saying in his introduction it's for that reason I'm called to be an apostle this is, this is my reason to proclaim this message so the church is without a gospel which means how is it the church then it's a social agency for the distribution of certain benefits and enjoyments and, and entirely without consequence in the world and even to itself okay so if the gospel would be nothing if men were not guilty and in need of the rescue which the gospel alone can afford you, you have no need you're not even aware that you need to be saved until you see what it is that has been provided then you can ask, what is it that required this about me? That's the revelation of the righteousness of God, is the revela right revelation of sin upon which his wrath is set. And that there's no revelation except of wrath, except through this gospel. Sin is the measure of salvation. Only they that know what it is to be saved know what it is to be lost. Only they who know what it is to be saved know what it is to be lost. You didn't know you were lost until you were saved. And then you know from what pit you have been dug and from what hell you have been saved. I say to the church, the church is correct, but it's lacking in fragrance. It's not enough to be correct. There's a fragrance that is waiting that we, we can only bring and I think Michael prayed 
last night or one of these days, uh, Lord, I don't have an alabaster box, and I wanted to interrupt him and say, you are the alabaster box. You don't come with something. You are it. And the only way to pour out the fragrance is your own breaking. And your breaking is relative to your understanding of the magnitude of what has been poured out for you. So our house is yet without fragrance, which is the knowledge, the fragrance of the knowledge of him in every place through us. Amen. That woman's act is remarkable. And isn't it equally remarkable that his own disciples were indignant at it? That he had to chastise them with those words? That she's done a good work upon me? The only reference to good work that Jesus ever acknowledged performed by a human being was her act. Why haven't we come to this breaking of our box, which is handsome and chiseled, and we want somehow to retain it and serve God with it intact? Or find a little spritz can where we give a little, a teaspoon, a little. But no, this fragrance requires an outpouring of the entire content, lavishly, that is performed by a woman, speaks volumes in itself. Because the men were indignant at the extravagance and the waste. But what did God do at the cross? Could anything be more extravagant? than the sending of his own son into the earth. Isn't that indignity enough? To take upon himself the form of a man, to be confined into a body, and have to suffer the humiliation of all that restriction and limitation, and in that, uh, 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 as a son of Abraham, the most despised race, the Jew, and in that to become a slave and suffer the death of um, the most scandalous kind. Can, can, can God the Father himself be more lavish than that? And will you know from the hell from which you've been saved by it? If we sense what hell is, which is not a polite subject, but when you look at the great sermons of old, uh, what is it, the uh, sin is in the hand of a, an angry God. People in the hearing of that sermon, which was read, clutched the pillars of the church, lest they slip through into the fire itself, which heat they felt at the soles of their feet by the very preaching. Now when you hear uh, today references to preaching like that, which we don't hear, they call it hell and brimstone, fire and brimstone, as if there's something about such messages that are contemptible and that we have graduated to more elevated forms of message. No, the most powerful and effective messages were to persuade people that they were sinners, and unless they repented and saw their condition and need, they would surely perish. Jesus himself said, I, re I read it this morning, in, in uh, John chapter 8, if you will not believe that I am he, you shall perish in your sins. What a fate that is eternal and irremediable. There's no remedy once you descend into that hell. It's just a long and unbroken <coughs> anguish of soul. It's a horror. But it's the just penalty for the wages of sin from which God wants us to be saved. But the righteous God provides also the remedy. And one of the things he condemns, as we'll read in Romans 1, is that people had forsaken God and taken for themselves idols have for, forfeited the creator for creation and are not thankful that's tagged on to the same statement they have forfeited God and have formed their own idols even of reptiles as well as four legged things and are not thankful somewhere in one of these commentaries the author says the great sin is the sin of ingratitude. So are we sufficiently grateful? And uh, have we sufficiently contemplated the basis for gratitude? It's not only the wrath of God, it's the righteous wrath of God. His wrath is righteous itself. His anger is not some petulance of the kind that we enjoy as, as human beings where we get mad or we get ticked off or we're in a huff. His wrath is righteous. It's a right response of a holy God to that which is willfully calculated against him. 
and the thought and conduct of mankind who have every reason to believe just in nature alone. Paul says they are without excuse for crea creation itself reveals the truth of God. And I wonder how many missionaries of the kind that we entertained recently going into the jungles of Brazil really have believed the testimony of Paul at the beginning that they are without excuse. You're going to a bunch of savages whose condition is their judgment. They are thoroughly cursed in their sin. Their minds are obdurate. Their hearts are black. They can murder. They can pillage. They can do because they have already forfeited the revelation of God through creation. And they are without excuse. Not only have they forfeited the Creator, but they have taken for themselves idolatries of their own choosing of four-legged things and creatures and, and, and uh, reptiles. reptiles, sneaking things, and worship them instead of God. And they are ungrateful. The missionaries need to go what they're coming into. This is not people who are just primitive, and uh, they need to come to an evolution from pagan primitivism to the acknowledgement of a monotheistic God to the more sophisticated recognition of the gospel and the revelation of Jesus unto discipleship. No. Their, their condition is already a judgment. And many, many a missionary comes back broken from his failure even to begin to crack this condition because they have not acknowledged that what they're facing is already a judgment for the forfeiture of God and that they are without excuse and that these savage people need to be confronted and accused. Your condition now is already the statement of your sin. And when we go into the other form of rebellion against righteousness, what, what does it take? Women, it Paul says, even women give over the natural function of their own bodies and uh, uh, develop a, a, uh, a perverse passion for each other. Even women. Why did he say even? Because women are supposed to be chaste and pure. We men, of course, are another thing. But women, but even when women will give over their natural bodies to, to that which is perverse, that is the judgment of the forfeiture of the righteousness of God. Homosexuality is, a, is an effect and not a cause. Homosexuality and lesbianism is already a judgment for sins already performed in the right and the rejection of the righteous God. And this is its outcome and this is its logic. And it is so perverse that if they'll not be converted in the recognition of the evil to which they have given themselves, by which the natural functions have been abandoned, and that they're slaves to these passions that torture them and enslave them, how then shall they come to a place of repentance? That the judgment itself is God's provision to be brought to a place of repentance when you see the wickedness of your condition and for which there's no escape and no remedy except through the power of the gospel to save but how is, how is that being spoken of today in the uh, secular world? Well, they can't help it. It's a biological thing. It's in the genes. They just have a disposition you know, from birth, completely disregarding the testimony of God. When I attended the Lutheran Seminary in St. Paul, and there was a discussion on how we ought to relate to homosexuals, and after all, Christ loves all the world, and they ought to be accepted, I, in my naivety, spoke up and said, you know, the, the scriptures call homosexuality an abomination in God's sight. Men lying with men. And the president of the, of the seminary cried out, who is that man who speaks like that and uh, is in ignorance of the most recent psychological findings? That the most recent psychological findings nullify Paul. That Paul was an ignoramus and did not have the advantage of sociology and psychology to understand the complex causes for homosexuality for which we need to be far more uh, sympathetic and not homophobic. No. Hey, listen, guys. This is the testimony of God. This is the apostle of God. He's speaking the truth of God, and we need to submit to his statements as being the description of evil. 
which the present world is unwilling to acknowledge because it's only Paul and the Word. But Paul and the Word is God. And part of our submission in righteousness is to, sub- is to submit to its truth. Or else we would be tempted to kind of go along and say, oh, the poor victims. Well, they couldn't help it. They had this issue in their upbringing. And no. Their condition is already a judgment. That they have allowed themselves to give over the natural function of their own bodies is already the thing to which God has abandoned them. He has abandoned them to their own illicit lust and this is the logic of its outworking. But the sin itself is the rejection of God as God, which is what all sin is. That this has become now epidemic uh, perversion, lesbianism, homosexuality is a universal thing that is now seeking for legitimacy and, uh, and acceptance as being as valid a mode of sexual relationship as um, what? heterosexuality. And it's just a choice of style of, of how your fancy and taste is. But it needs to be presented to our children in the classroom as an option as legitimate as any. Whew. Oh, saints, we're suffering in the world and in our nations for the want of a church that hates iniquity and loves righteousness and has accepted the testimony of God that explains that these perversions are already a judgment and that the sin is God rejection and even the rejection of his word which God sets out painstakingly from chapter 1 in the most authoritative encyclopedic statement of faith given by this great apostle in the book of Romans you're without excuse. You've ignored the testimony of creation and nature. You've ignored the testimony of the word. And now you're suffering the consequence of a willful ignorance. When I, when I confront Jews, I don't start them off with, uh, are you saved, brother? What do you think of Jesus? I start them off with, how much time have you spent in the libraries of the university? Knowing from my own experience how much time that is chasing after some esoteric subject in the requirement to get your degree so you'll have a route to uh, financial security and success. How much time have you spent examining the statement of a man who is purported to be the Messiah of Israel and very God himself who has come into earth at a certain point of time to effect a redemption for the, for the uh, rejection of which there'll be an eternal penalty? How much time have you spent considering eternity itself How much time have you spent considering God himself? When have you opened the testimony of God? These things are written that you might believe and believing have life. Why haven't you once opened while you've read Jung and Freud and Adler and every half-baked character and brooded over these books and spent hours in their contemplation? You've never once opened the Holy Writ. You will be judged for what you have chosen to ignore. And would to God that be a church that is confrontive and pushing this into the face of a willfully unbelieving world who is suffering the consequence of their willful unbelief, which is godlessness and unrighteousness, and for which the penalty in this life is severe. What of the penalty of the hell to come? We have failed, dear saints, to take God seriously. We're doing despite to the grace of God. It's as if he has not suffered what he has suffered. And we have reduced it to a little cheapy, glib formula and little phrase, are you saved, brother? Mm-hmm. Because the grace of God has given a rudimentary um, benefit to mankind called conscience. But conscience can be seared by a continued unwillingness to be pricked by it and finally to be deadened to it so that it had no longer has any effect at all. And what, where have we seen this? We've seen this in the history of Nazism. A whole nation is robbed of conscience and can perform putting bodies in ovens as if they're dealing with hot dogs or reduce the people to a number and rob them of humanity and go home and have their Christmas dinners and sing carols without any conflict because their consciences have become seared. 
God has provided men are without excuse either by the testimony of nature the testimony of their consciences the testimony of the word of God all of which is a willful rejection which is sin itself the willful rejection of God is the essence of what sin is because well why would men reject God because he cuts into your lifestyle because he says thou shalt not because he's a God of righteousness and law and because he's established commandments and we don't want to be infringed upon and want to do our own thing as if we ourselves are God I still remember the horrified looks of Dana's, Inga's uh, brothers and sisters when I spoke at the Pentecostal church in Rondas and uh, while I'm speaking the brother is, re- is looking at the catalog on racing bikes that was his idol and I'm pouring out my soul and I said something like do you think that this earth is your your playground to enjoy and this is like coming into someone else's house without even asking and walking right in and, and trafficking your mud right up to the carpet and going straight to the refrigerator and taking what you want and stuffing your face like a glutton and then not even taking your shoes off, plopping on the couch and leaving behind a mess, as if this is your right. Have you ever considered the earth is the Lord's and the nations thereof and those who dwell therein? This is not your baby. You're trafficking and, and exploiting the world as if it's yours, as if there's not a God who has created for his purpose. So what does Paul say in Rome in uh, Acts 17 when he goes to Mars Hill? God has made of one blood all nations of men and established the bounds of the habitation that they might seek after him and be found of him. That the whole purpose of your life is to obtain a knowledge of God. It's not for your bicycle racing and your pleasure and the exploitation of, of uh, the world and its resources. You're acting in complete disregard to the creator and his intention for creation. And that God has winked in times past but he commands all men now everywhere to repent. For he has appointed a day in which he will judge all men by that man whom he's raised from the dead. That's preaching. And you know what the scholars say? That was Paul's worst performance. He did not establish a church in Athens. That his message was somehow um, lost and vain. And I count it as one of the high watermarks of Paul's remarkable and acute perception of what reality is that even the purposes for which nations are created is for the purpose of salvation. Some have even suggested that Adam was made necessary because of Jesus. God had to bring an Adam who would first fall in sin and bring his taint to the whole human race as the federal head so that a second Adam would come to, to um, lift men out of that fallen condition so that the second Adam justifies the first. God brought the first Adam only because he knew that the second Adam would not be understood except in the light of being a new federal head for the new human race uh, out of redemption through his blood. That God would go that far. That God has gone so far for creation. That men would be without excuse in the way in which he has structured it. And what do we read in Ephesians 3? That um, God has created all things in order that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be demonstrated to the principalities and powers of the air. And this is the eternal purpose of God in Christ Jesus. What? The whole of creation? Just to provide a platform and a stage for the existence of a church and whose character a demonstration is to be made corporately that once and for all defeats the eternal foe of God, the powers of the air? And that's the reason for creation? that it's not there for industry and and mass production and high style of living. It's there for an eternal transaction through the church. So we need to align ourselves with what God says is the purpose for creation, the purpose for the world, the purpose for the church. For the neglect and indifference and rejection of those purposes is sin itself. And the church itself is not absolved of that sin. While it is using the world for its pleasure, its success, its satisfaction, its enjoyment, and even saying that the gospel is God's provision for your social elevation. 
and to a better lifestyle and a prosperity. So that my first message in Nairobi, all those years again, ago, and the lunchtime prayer service of Christian downtown office workers was inspired by God. Don't think that the gospel is God, God's provision for your social mobility, that you should have a three-piece suit and a ministry and a car and a secretary. The gospel has purposes much more earnest than your social elevation. You have completely misconstrued the issue of the gospel. And it came as a powerful indictment on an African church that looks to America for its models and wants also to attain to the kind of lifestyle that its celebrated uh, televangelists exhibit who want you to send them their, your contributions as seed faith. I would be much more respectful if they said, send it to some dinky uh, other place, but don't send it to us because we need to exhibit our own message by our faith and not by your money and your donations. So, oh dear saints, we need much to lament and much to repent for we have paid the bill. And we have idolized these characters and, and uh, provided for their cushy lifestyles in which the message of the gospel is completely denigrated and lost. As its ministers, so also the church, and as the church, so also the nation. The Lord can lay at the door of the church full accountability for the condition of our nation and its drift into homosexuality, lesbianism, and Sodom and Gomorrah standards as being approved and uh, appropriate. Because Paul says at the end of his statement, not only do they do these things, but there are those who approve them, knowing that they lead to death, and yet sanction and approve them as good. That's the final statement of evil, is the approval of evil as being somehow good. So, so deranged is man through his sin. And so there's a basis for repentance. If we ourselves are rightly aligned with God, we need to pray for the church with which we're identified and for which our Jewish kinsmen are suffering the lack of that model that would move them to jealousy. That they might be grafted in it again. And that therefore they are perishing wholesale and the nation itself is in the most pathetic of conditions for the want of the revelation of God that ought to have been given it by the church in its midst. Rightly so, repenting for our own condition, our lack of a proper understanding that was available to us in Scripture. Why haven't we seen it? For our own willingness to be satisfied with a reduction of the gospel as a glib formula, step one, step two, step three, without the deepest understanding of the wrath, the righteous wrath of God for sin that required that wrath to fall upon his son, that we might be saved. Lord, my God, we're in pitiful condition, you know. And we've lost that apostolic sense of the gospel. And what are we, my God, without a message that has the power to save? And how saved are we? who have been inducted into this shallow Christianity by just signing on the dotted line and believing and praying after someone else. Say this, my God, it shows we lack the depth, the gravity, the sense, the reality of God as righteous. And therefore our own conduct is unrighteous. And we take liberties and, and we're not affected by the downward spiral in our nation and in the world. We've learned to live with it comfortably. And maybe these guys are not all that bad. Maybe we are homophobic. Maybe the problem was with, with us that, that we can't uh, acknowledge them and give them full equal access even to becoming ministers themselves. Even bishops. Yes. Heads of the church. And that somehow we're discriminating against them because we have this hang-up. Homophobic. When in fact of the matter is it's evil. And the evidence of sin in its worst form as not the thing in itself, but as a judgment for sin that already is in the rejection of God as God. So, Lord, look upon us, my God. We don't even know how to cry out. We don't even know how to pray. What shall we say, Lord? 
we're, we're battling against upstream, we're going against the stream because the stream is human betterment and getting on the bestseller list yes. and your large church is not big enough until you get a stadium because the crowds are coming like a wave wanting such an easy and pleasant message of improvement rather than the necessity for a death and a resurrection oh lord oh lord the bestseller list condemns us thank you my god the billy graham and uh, in, in Queens where I went to hear him before coming here for the summer has on, on the platform Hillary and the Bill Clinton in the friendliest exchange of buddy buddy oh. condoning and validating one another as if this man has not been the uttermost disgrace of any president who has ever occupied the White House conducting his orgiastic practices with a Jewish woman in the uh, whatchamacallit room and, and uh, nearly avoiding being what you would call it impeached, impeached. Yeah. and boasted about it that he had done the nation's service by his impeachment trial and if, and if he could there were people who would elect him now and Billy Graham could say you know you make a great preacher you have a way with words your wife ought to be president and you ought to be preaching and people laughed I went away sick in my soul that I came all the way for the hours to come to that uh, 70,000 people crowded in to hear the great evangelist and to hear them complimenting each other and for him to give a little Pablo message that had no convicting power at all. That's our condition. That's our state. These are the evangelists that are buddy-buddy with presidents and people in power in high places. Lord, 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 forgive us, my God, precious God, and help us. Help us, Lord. What a, what a pathetic scene that this old croc, lacking sleep, is trying to uh, affect the resurrection of a message that has fallen into complete neglect and has not been known in our time and generation. Oh, Lord, help us, my God, with a little help to be of service to you in these last days and to be to the people of Israel what we must, not only in word and deed, but in what we are in ourselves that would bring conviction because we love righteousness and hate iniquity and will not look the other way and pay them compliments as many Christians do and say to Jews you're more Christian than most Christians that I know when they're so ungodly as even to consider Christ and have disregarded him as some accident of history that need not be considered but they live nicely Lord, my God, my God, my God, bring us to the word of God as being the defining statement of truth. However contrary to our subjectivity, however contrary to the wisdom of the world as it is expressed in magazines and newspapers, that homosexuality and lesbianism is not a genetic defect. It's a choice and for which we will be held accountable and pay the penalty both in this life and the life to come. For no effeminate, no homosexual, no coward, no liar need think he can enter the kingdom of God. You have made it clear. Without holiness, no man shall see God. Righteousness is the key to the kingdom. And we bless you, Lord, that it is so. For only a righteous God would require it and not be lenient and say, well, we understand your, your life, you grew up without a proper father, your marriage, blah, 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 blah. And so, no. He requires holiness. He requires righteousness and gives us every provision by the blood of Jesus to attain it and by the power of his spirit to be sanctified. Gives us a church to grow up in in which we can receive correction and rebuke and the prayer that we might be a holy people for his name. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. Forgive us, my God. We have fallen short of your glory. We have too quickly accepted every glib alternative, my God. We've not insisted upon the apostolic standard set forth by Paul from the beginning of chapter 1 of his great book. But we want to consider it now, and we're asking a grace and a mercy on your part that we might continue in it. And if you'll do it, Lord, and give it, we know something will be required from us that will not make us popular. Even Christians will be offended by us in our insistence on this gospel. In an ecumenical age, 
where everybody believes in God in his own way. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. That even Muslims believe in God in their own way so they can saw off the head of a Jewish victim or any other and think that they're doing Allah's service. And even our president is the one who says that they believe in the same God. Not the God that I know. But it's politic in a pluralistic society to approve of all forms of worship and not to insist on your Christocentric model, which is a form of narrow fascism that everyone has to believe your gospel and your message as if it's the ex exclusive way to God and there is no other. Who are you to insist on it? That's arrogance and impudence. What's the matter with Judaism? Look at how, how impressive these people are. And how impressive are you for the insistence on your narrow gospel? Whew. The fats and the fire saints. So my God, help us. Help us with a little help, Lord. My God, we're willing to give up a total night's sleep if you would have the greater possession to bring your passionate and urgent jealousy to our consideration. Thank you, my God, that we would break our lives as alabaster boxes before you and pour them out. For well, that's the purpose. For, we have no other purpose for our being but to glorify God and serve him. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, hear our groanings and our cry for the church in its present condition and that we ourselves are culpable and have contributed to it and have gone along with it. Hear our cry, Lord. We're not persuading our own children. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness oppress or suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them ever since the creation of the world. His eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. Therefore, God has given them up to the lust of their own hearts, to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because... They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For this reason God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women, even their women exchanged natural intercourse for the natural in the same way also the men giving up the natural with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious toward parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, they know not God, God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, yet they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. Thank you for Paul. Thank you for apostolic seeing. Thank you for truth that is unsparing and clear and incisive. 2,000 years ago, it's as if someone is speaking today right on with surgical precision and exactitude of things as God sees them and gives us the cause, the therefores and the becauses. They willfully have rejected the knowledge of God. They do not want to consider. Therefore, God has abandoned them to the outworking of their own lust in its most degrading forms. Thank you that your righteousness, my God, is like that. You abandon, you don't inflict. It's the logic of their own rejection. Whatsoever man sows, that too shall he reap. There's a moral law of the universe that needs to be recognized. 
and we see it being acted out in our day. So we bless you, Lord. Restore apostolic seeing. Restore apostolic jealousy for the gospel. Restore apostolic proclamation of the gospel. May it come to Denmark. May it come to Sweden. May it come to those places where uh, infidelity, divorce, homosexuality, lesbianism, and every kind of thing is sanctioned as somehow normal and deserving of approval and that there's something wrong with us if we flinch at it. uh, We are the problem. We should be far more acceptive and tolerant of these varieties of human conduct which are just as valid as the normal use of the body. Lord, the the age is evil and we have not known it. We do not hate that iniquity, my God. And we do not speak out against it. We do not love righteousness because we have not understood righteousness. So grant us, my God, that love that you have for righteousness that did not uh, enable you to withhold your only son. Righteousness required his death and a shameful death of such a kind, Lord, that is stupefying that you would permit it. Only evil and its wickedness and your righteous wrath against it will will explain it. Teach us, give us back the gospel in a jealous inheritance and an obligation as Paul saw it as a privilege, my gospel he called it, that I've been given the stewardship of so great a message that we have allowed to to fall into a mere formula step one, step two and that the great evangelists of our days hardly even know it, that all Roberts applauds a $25 million church building in the lush and posh California suburb as being the issue of the gospel. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, give us a sense of your grief that we might bear it with you as sons and daughters who do not want you to suffer it alone. Sober us. Deep in us, my God, we're shallow. Somebody mentioned Woody Allen today, and I said I've been praying for him. We need to be praying for these men who are sailing along uh, with Steven Spielberg and the great uh, culture expositors in their dream factories and all of those who are moving toward an eternal doom and do not know it. So that the head editor of Commentary Magazine, Norman Port Horace, when I paid a thousand dollars to attend his banquet, greeted me at the door and he heard my name, he said, I'm too old to be evangelized. I said, all the more reason. You're close, brother, closer than you know. One foot is already in the grave. And unless you repent and receive a foolish message through a foolish messenger, you shall altogether likewise perish. I don't want to eternity even to think of the cry from such a man that he's in a place without remedy, who is in a sense ethical, moral, concerned with issues in his magazine, and yet is himself intrinsically unrighteous in the neglect and rejection of God. Where are we with regard to the message? How internalized uh, has it become for us? How much real at the grit the pit and marrow of our own being that we're not just giving a hopeful suggestion we're speaking words with conviction that men cannot turn we're not giving them a casual option it's not just a um, an opinion it's a conviction that demands consideration lest you perish there's not, there's not enough of that kind of witness because we have to become something not just acknowledge something And to become that something requires the very cross which Jesus was impaled. Because we have shrunk from that cross, we're not in a place to proclaim it. And if we do make reference to it, it's unctuous, it's just polite. But we've got to be the thing in ourselves. Paul was the thing in himself. And we need to be so also to be. It will require our deaths. But eternity is at stake for many because of it. We need to ask that unlike Paul, are we ashamed of the gospel? Maybe instinctively and inwardly. Outwardly we would say no, we subscribe. But is there really inwardly a shame? We 
when it comes to the nitty gritty of speaking to a respectable person whose life is even more impressive than ours, morally, culturally, intellectually, can we bring the foolishness of this message with conviction or will we shrink? To face the world and all of its esteem in the foolishness of this message with the conviction that will penetrate and the anointing of God that is given to those who obey him is no small requirement. And I'm saying we'll not attain to that except we receive the deaths that um, are for us from where we presently are and where we need to become. Search the scriptures. Read the references to, of Jesus. And read the, the great message, the sermons of Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Read the warnings in Hebrew in the book of Hebrews for those who have tasted the grace of God and again have fallen back uh, whether they could be renewed again unto, self, unto repentance that the prospect of hell may be even a consideration for those who were once saved and allowed their salvation to fall into neglect so there much, there's much to be considered even the prospect of such a fear is sobering for those that believe and w would we be as reckless as we presently are, as my own son presently is, divorcing his wife, submitting his children to being ravaged by the courts and being divided between parents in, in the fulfillment of his own lust for a woman, if he had any fear that that would be a, a, a way in which he would find himself slipping step by step into hell? Would he have, would he have entered into so cavalier a, a career as divorce if he knew that by such a means of acting against God who says I hate divorce and putting away you would have been restrained from your own indulgence because you want to respect what God hates because if you disrespect it you disrespect God and how long will it be before the process of your estrangement from him will lead you again to the prospect of eternal separation for no liar nor effeminate or, or homosexual or violent or how God said need to think they can enter the kingdom of, of heaven don't think you got it made because you once said uh, I accept you you may be more than you know a candidate yourself for eternal separation and anguish of soul if that's not so we ought at least to live with the possibility that it may be so and even that possibility would be a factor toward walking more blamelessly before him. We need to have the fear of God restored. We need to face the question, which has not yet come up in our consideration, but now occurs to me, do we think that hell is even righteous for God? He's the one who has established it. Is that becoming to God to have a hell in which there's an eternal burning without remedy and an anguish of soul with, uh, without answer? Can, are we reconciled to a God who is a God not only of heaven but also of hell? Or are we embarrassed by a God who finds such a, a, a eternal thing necessary? Couldn't he have figured out a way for human redemption without the necessity of that threat? Is it unbecoming to him? Or is it the very statement of his righteousness? Does righteousness itself require it? That there's a moral requirement that if not in this life and eternity men will reap what they have sown and that they will not in one way be an iota in excess of what they deserve for the wages of sin is death and in exact proportion to your, what you have sown you will reap I just gave uh, Zach a copy of Spur S Spurgeon's sermon on that very topic and I, I thought it was so important that we had a special meeting at Ben Israel in which I read the whole sermon to the, to the collected body that we needed to hear a Spurgeon statement that the wages of sin is death that hell is totally a righteous recompense for a reckless life indifferent to God that it's not at all an offense to God but is totally in keeping with himself with what he is in himself as righteous have we really made that peace have we wrestled with this some of, our, of us are embarrassed that God is even the God of judgment. We don't really like it. We like his mercy. We like his love. 
this kindness, but that he will judge, that he's appointed a day in which he will judge all men, but that man whom he's raised from the dead, why that man? Because when we face that judge, we're looking at a man with scars. That reminds us that he's fit to judge because he's paid the price for judgment in being himself judged. Here's the evidence. So what are you going to say to him? What excuse will you give? What justification for your calculated, willful offense against God and a failure to heed and to regard him, though he's made many efforts at, at speaking to you and saving you from the course which you headlong flung yourself in obstinate disregard to his warning? What will you say to him in that day? We ought to be fearful just for the day of judgment. That's why Paul said, I press on for the high calling of God that I might be raised in that first resurrection. That when the Lord comes, those that are dead in Christ will rise first and those that remain barely surviving will rise with them. Otherwise, if you don't rise then, you'll have to wait and linger in the grave for another thousand years to the general resurrection of all the dead because you didn't make it with the first. The second resurrection is called a death. And there the books are opened at the book of life and to see if your name is written in it. Why? Because Revelation chapter 3 says it may well have been blotted out. Your reckless and indifferent life, even as a believer, can, can blot you out of a book in which you were once inscribed. And in that day, when that book is opened, your heart is beating like a trip hammer, waiting to see whether it's there or not. Because if it's not there, it's bye-bye baby. And a Jewish Christian theologian now got on to be the Lord said, nothing more reveals the radical content of the gospel than its confrontation with the synagogue. There's a reason to God's madness why he gives the priority to the Jew first. Why Jesus said, uh, go ye into all the world to preach this gospel to every creature, beginning at Jerusalem and unto Judea, then to the uttermost corners. Begin where I was crucified. Begin where the prophets were stoned. Begin where the opposition is most acute in every way. And once you can weather that, by the power of the message itself, then you can rightly go to the Greeks. Why are we in our depleted condition? We have ignored the priority. As if God had not, had not spoken through Paul. At the very beginning to the church at Rome, which is the paradigm of the church everywhere, to the Jew first. We will not know and understand the magnitude of this message in its foolishness which requires the power of God until we will face them. So we need to pray for a church to be obedient to the priority in its every community because have you noticed there are Jews in every community? Omaha, Nebraska, Oshkosh, Idaho, Copenhagen, doesn't matter where you are. You're, they're there and they're there as a presence waiting for our obedience. Try it sometime. It's death. It's humiliation. It's the door slammed in your face. It is utter and contemptuous disregard as if you're a non-entity and not worthy of even the faintest consideration. Total absurdity, all the more if you're a Jew who proclaims it to Jews. So there's a reason why Paul gives that priority from the first. Because nothing else will bring forth the gospel in its power than in its total absurdity when you bring it to the epitome of civilization itself, the Jew. So let's be obedient. And that the issue of eternity is so great, it is not too extravagant for God to bring a holocaust and to bring a second holocaust in order to occasion a repentance because it's through repentance that faith comes. Repent and believe ye the gospel. If you're hardened and you're unrepentant, you cannot believe, though people would give you the most majestic egg, uh, exposition of the gospel. Repentance is the key to believing. And so, unless we ourselves come to them in our own brokenness, in the memory of our own salvation out of so great a death, that we were equally guilty in sins of their kind, how shall we rightly speak a word that can foment repentance rather than indignation at our moral and spiritual superiority? Because we, we have it and you're not with the program. See what I mean? We've got to come to them 
in a certain way that is yet wanting that waits upon the recognition of our own depravity which we share with them and only by the grace of God have we had this revealed to us that we can avail ourselves what was intended initially for them to the Jew first so Lord again we pray for mercy there is not a righteous man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not and if God were to mark iniquity who can stand where are we in any way superior to our Jewish kinsmen Lord that there's a grace and mercy that came to us totally undeserved and the reason that it came is that we should move them to, to jealousy by the gracious exhibition of what we have obtained that was totally undeserved so my God uh, help us to this we pray that you might honor that witness Lord and bring us into actual confrontation with this people we don't, we, we don't have to look far they're in our community we've not encountered them because we've not prayed for them but start praying that we want opportunity to fulfill the mandate and the priority and see how long it will be before God will show you that your dentist or your lawyer or the neighbor around the corner or your kid's teacher is in fact a Jew and that you would have opportunity to share with them in proportion to your prayer so we bless you Lord there's something very alive before us today that has not changed one whit from the, from the moment that Paul wrote it in his epistle to the Romans help us for, from being cop outs and, and circumventing your priority and obligation we want to rush off to exotic places to witness but to this people who are before our noses we are indifferent and in ignorance we're moral cowards and we know that to confront them will reveal our inadequacy it will test us in ways that we're not prepared to face so we're asking Lord for grace, for mercy for ourselves to be what we ought to this people and then also because of that to the Greek we thank you and praise you Lord for this message, this gospel our privilege to be its bearers and expositors Righteousness is an issue of faith, and faith cannot be obtained uh, righteous without faith through as many as will believe. And that our witness is an issue of faith also because it's obeying the mandate and the priority of God as it is written. That obedience is faith. And the, the ability to perform that obedience is the faith that believes for an enablement by the Holy Spirit that is given to them that obey him so God has established the whole remarkable saga in the context of faith faith to believe unto salvation faith to commend the gospel to others in obedience to the word for the just shall live by their faith serve by their faith and without faith it's impossible to please God faith is obedience to the word of God unbelief is a sin because it disregards what God has said and will not believe him for it so faith is righteous and only by faith can we please God so we thank you my God you've given us the faith to believe this message grant us the faith my God to commend it to others and as we walk in our uh, conscious inadequacy especially coming to the Jew it will find us out will be revealed for the numbskulls that we are who have barely graduated high school and whose grammar is imperfect and will trip all over our tongues and stutter when we stand before their worldly composure that we can believe that you'll give us a grace and an anointing that shreds and reveals the paucity, the, the fraudulence of their earthly credentials. That a word of God anointed is more powerful than academic credentials. 
and that in the foolishness of our choked and spluttering presentation, men can be brought to faith and to believe because there's an intrinsic power in that message that you have imputed. And that we're willing to trust you for that, even at the cost of our embarrassment. Thank you, Lord. If we'll not face that, how do we go on to anything in God, in the realm of faith, in the last days, in sanctification, fulfillment of anything, if we miss it here at the first? That's why it's given at the beginning, not just for our academic contemplation, but for our obedience. Seal that note, Lord. I'm, I'm pleased with the way in which you have unfolded the subject today. Precious. Let nothing be lost, my God, in the way in which you have uh, made these points. And because your works will not return to your void. And when we return to our places, remind us again of what we've heard and what you've said. Obedience is faith your requirement, your mandate to this people, the epitome of the world, in all of its arrogance, in all of its ability, in all of its intimidation to us whose lives are imperfect. And yet we're required to preach and to speak this foolish message. We bless you, my God, because we're willing to bear some measure of the humility that you bore in much greater proportion in nakedness at that cross. What is it for us to catch a little flack from a Jew and, and to be told that we're jerks and upstarts and how dare we in our impudence to suggest that they're lost? What is that to us to suffer that, uh, that their, their indignation when you have suffered what you have totally in degradation, humiliation, nakedly, even before your own people? We're without excuse, Lord, if we shrink from our small humiliation in view of yours. And because you bore that, God has exalted you and given you a place above every name, both in heaven and earth, and a throne higher than the heavens, because you were willing to be brought into that humiliation down. He has exalted you up and given you a name, and to that name every knee will bow. Uh, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow to the glory of God the Father. You exalt those who are willing to be humbled. <coughs> and so our eternal place and our eternal reward is altogether proportionate to the humiliations we are willing to bear in this life in obedience, my God, to your call and to your word. And Jesus himself is the evidence that he who was abased is now exalted. And that Israel itself will be abased, that it might be exalted as the head of nations. And that we will be willing to suffer abasement and humiliation in view of the exaltation that will be ours eternally in heaven. Thank you, Lord. Put a seal on all this, my God. Let nothing fall to the floor. Let it affect our every future consideration at this school that something has affected us, modified us, touched us in our deeps, and therefore we will see and consider everything that you will be pleased to give in, the, in that modification. We don't want to lose it, Lord. May it temper our souls permanently. We thank and give you praise for how you have been pleased to express yourself today for our benefit in your so great mercy. In Jesus' name. Amen.